Good morning. How's everybody? I like the call and response. Great. You awake? <laughs> um, thanks for having me there, here this morning. I was listening uh, to Anand earlier during the keynote. And there's one thing that I absolutely agree with, which is that there is no one playbook. We don't have the answers. But we are certainly trying and experimenting and doing some different things and seeing what works and what doesn't. So I'm here to share some of that with you today. So we'll talk a little bit about this portfolio of new businesses that we've been trying to launch at Comcast. Um, how many people know Comcast? How many people have Comcast service today? OK, we're in New York, so we don't serve the market. OK, thank you. Um, Comcast um, is a huge company. Um, we also are owners of NBC and Universal. So not only do we provide video and internet and wireless services today, but we also provide TV production, we have movie studios, we have parks, we have theme parks, all kinds of things that give us a great basis for thinking of new ways of growing and innovating our company in the long term. Our group um, is something called strategic development, where we bring together people who manage business deals and partnerships for Comcast, and people who are thinking every day about how to launch and innovate around new business ventures. And our goal is to find new businesses that can help drive long-term growth and long-term synergy with any of those businesses that I, that I mentioned earlier in our core. Not easy, but we'll give you some examples of, of the things that we're doing. That's me, I don't have to talk about me much, um, but I've been at Comcast for about 10 years and always working outside of the core business, trying to reinvent what is now called our X1 platform, which is our new cloud-based platform for our video product, to joint ventures uh, that we've tried with Verizon Wireless, um, to the group that we're in today, always pushing the envelope and thinking differently about how we pursue growth and innovation at the company. So what have we done in strategic development so far? Some of you may or may not know, but we launched a mobile wireless service. And this idea was something that we've been thinking about for many, many years. We are obviously in the media and connectivity business today. The mobile screen and the mobile device is a very important screen to get to. We had to figure out over time what was the right way to participate in that market. So we incubated a few ideas around how to enter mobile in our group. And just last year, we did launch fully scaled a business around Xfinity Mobile. That service is not designed to take over the world and replace or displace Verizon Wireless or AT&T or anybody else, but to figure out how to drive value to our existing customers and make sure that those customers that have broadband service today also have seamless connectivity inside and outside of the home because that's all they care about. And so this is a new venture you'll hear more about, but within about a year, we're over a million lines so far and growing quickly. We've also launched a business called Machine Q. Machine Q is also kind of in that space of connectivity, but what we learned is we do a great job at providing a local area network, Wi-Fi in the home that has great bandwidth, high speed, gets you to any device connected in your home. We also have 19 million hotspots outside of the home that also we use as part of our Xfinity mobile service. But there's a whole category of devices that don't have batteries, that don't have connectivity today, that don't need necessarily high capacity throughput, but just want to send some signals to say, I'm here, I'm on, open or close. And so this is our enterprise IoT business that is really trying to tackle the problem of all these billions and billions of unconnected devices in the outside world and make sure the uh, technology we call LoRaWAN that those devices have access to connectivity, services, and businesses are able to see what's happening. So for example, we have probably over about 100 contracts signed to date. We've deployed in over 15 markets across the country. Um, and this is everything from Fairway IQ, which is trying to measure uh, what's happening on golf courses and giving that information back to the golf course owners to property managers who are trying to make sure by putting these small lightweight sensors around the pipes in a bathroom that there's not a leak, a leak or no leak, and then therefore can avoid catastrophic events in the future. So think of manhole covers. Again, no battery, no connectivity today. How do you put these lightweight, long battery life sensors on those disconnected devices and make sure to provide them with access to connectivity and information and data back to the owners who do something with it. 
So that's Machine Q, again, a small business that just started and launched officially last year, and we're starting to scale and deploy now. Another example, we heard a little uh, mention of this earlier, is healthcare. And we might have some head scratches of why are we looking at healthcare. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about some of the lessons learned here. But we did launch um, and announce earlier this April, this year, a joint venture with Independence Blue Cross, where we're going to go to market together and build an internet-based platform that helps patients with their healthcare journey. So after they get through a procedure or they have a visit, there's a lot of opportunity to provide better connectivity between a patient in the hospital when they leave the hospital and provide them with the right information and care services when they're in the home. And there's lots of reasons that we believe we're in a good position to help Independence Blue Cross and other insurers and providers in the future. And this is a venture, again, that we just launched earlier this year and our MVP will launch later. Secrets of success. So I have the same note as, as Arthur. There's no secrets here, and we can't claim full success, but we can describe some of the things that we're doing and learning along the way. First, when we look for new ideas and we figure and we're trying to figure out, should we go after healthcare? Should we go after the enterprise internet of things? Should we go after solar, which we had some um, experiments in as well? We do try to look beyond market size as the primary indicator of whether that business is interesting to us or not. Now, a company of our size clearly needs to go after large opportunities for it to move the needle and make a difference to our bottom line. But it's not just the $3.3 trillion in healthcare that we're interested in. It's the rate of disruption. It's how much uh, technology innovation is happening, the digitization of what's happening in that category. It's deregulation, new incentives that put a lot more weight on value-based care than in the past. Um, it's also the fact that we are a self-insured company and we spend $1.3 billion every year in healthcare. So if we can solve this for the industry, we can also solve it for our own employee base. There's a lot of reasons that we would look at enterprise internet of things as well. We believe that that market is probably over $150 billion. Uh, we believe there's, again, billions of disconnected devices that could benefit from some connectivity. We also think it's a natural extension of the work that we do today. There's not a dominant player yet, so we also have the ability to influence and shape that market. And we believe we have strategic assets in place that can give us a leg up and a competitive advantage. So there's lots of factors that we look at before deciding whether to explore opportunities in a category. Market size and market potential is but one of them. We also try to run low risk, low cost experiments. So in the case of healthcare, healthcare is a lot of things. We don't want to get into medicine or delivery of care, et cetera. But could we test early on whether there was a way we could participate in the value creation to customers when they're in the home? We did tests with UC Davis. We did tests with Kaiser Permanente early on just to see if we can create a body of content and a body of knowledge and content that we could deliver over our platforms, whether that's in the home on the X1 or on mobile or on desktop, that could tell the story to patients about what they were experiencing in a relatable, non-scary way and make sure they were getting it just like they get all the other content they consume in our homes today. Those low-cost experiments gave us a few things. It gave us more confidence that there was a role we could play in this market. It gave us access to interesting partners that we could figure out who would be the best one to start with, an insurer, a provider, a managed care organization, somebody else. And it got, just got us enough traction to say, maybe there's a way and there's an opportunity to invest more. Which is the next one. Build rigorous business cases to inform the next steps. So we try to take the output of these low cost, low risk experiments and figure out, can we really build a model that we can believe in? Now there's not a lot of data and history of Comcast participating in healthcare, for example, but we do hold the teams accountable for putting together a business case that we can understand all the what ifs and the what must you believes to get people on board and to help us invest more capital in that business. If it's a category, we look at kind of two dimensions. One is what's the potential, the potential of that opportunity based on all the reasons I said earlier. And also, what's our level of certainty? Do we believe that we know how we can go to market and make cash flow and get all the returns that we want out of that business? If it's something that we have a high potential for, but low certainty, we just want to validate. 
And so we allocate capital, my team allocates capital, um, and the right amount to say just do enough to prove out these things before we get the confidence to invest further. In other cases where we're not sure about the potential, but we're certain that there's probably a role for us to play, we want to reserve our option. And so I invest a little bit less to make sure we put some bets in a couple different places until we have confidence about how we can really increase the size or the potential of, our, of that business. And then along the way, we want to stay open to the different ways that we can go to market. This is one of the learnings I'll talk about, but we have to stay open to partnering and pivoting and buying things even if that's what's required to get us the confidence and the momentum we need in that category. When we got started in the health business, we did some of, again, these low-cost experiments by ourselves. It became very clear that we needed more healthcare expertise inside the company, inside the team. So early on, we made a pretty small bet, but we still made it, and we acquired a company called Mana Health. So we could bring on board a small team of people who were steeped in the healthcare business, that were building technology and understood all the platforms inside of healthcare systems today, and we're already working on this tough challenge of articulating and helping patients understand their data around their healthcare conditions in flexible platforms and user experiences. We also realized early on that it wasn't good enough for us to try to go to market by ourselves. In order to crack into the healthcare market, we needed more credibility. We needed access to sales channels that we didn't have today. And that's part of the reason that we went um, into a joint venture with Independence Blue Cross, one of the largest blues in the country um, that already has that, cap that uh, customer base, they already have access to the other blues, and can provide a valuable, not just a valuable channel, but valuable data about health records and other information we could help a string together. Missteps, and I know I'm running a little long, but I'll try to go fast. I don't know how many of you uh, relate to some of these experiences, but I am in a large company, and I think I saw it downstairs as well. We sometimes believe we can do everything on our own. And our natural bias is to design a, a new business where we build ourselves. We put a whole team together. We're going to do it ourselves. The problem is that takes a long time, and sometimes we don't have the right expertise. And so we have to figure out how not to get caught in this trap of assuming that if we're going to go into a new category, we can build it on our own. The second is relying on the on integration with the core business too much or too soon. Now, for us, we want there to be connective tissue between the businesses that we invest in in the future and the businesses that we have today. We want there to be some strategic alignment between what we do today and what we do tomorrow. But sometimes, some of our businesses, we rely too much on that integration before we can prove out and validate that it's something that we're really serious about. For example, in one of the cases when we entered the gaming market, it was critical that in order to go to market, we had to integrate with existing platforms, and in this case, the X1. The problem is that the X1 already has a long roadmap. They already have priorities, and so getting prioritization on that was really difficult, and we couldn't rely on that in order to prove out whether we can be in the gaming business or not. We have lots of examples of that, but I think you get my point. And the final one here is recognizing yellow flags too late. In the case of healthcare, Early on, we think we overinvested in the needs of one particular customer who had agreed to be our first customer. And the problem is that the sales cycles in healthcare are very long. And so by the time we started talking to and getting serious with other potential customers, we realized that the approach we were taking and the platform or product we were building probably wouldn't meet their needs. And so we have to be honest with ourselves that as committed we, as we are to these ideas, we have to make sure we're listening to more voices and making sure that we're not getting over-invested in the needs and, and the strategies around one particular or one set of customers. So going forward, what do we need to do? Move faster. We're a bigger company. It takes a long time to get things done. We have to make decisions faster, and we have to get conviction about our need to be in this new, these new businesses faster than we do today. We need to place bigger bets. So for a company of our size, in order to move the needle truly, we need to be targeting opportunities that are at least a billion dollars in operating cash flow at scale. That's what makes a difference when you're an $85 billion company. And that means that to, before we get there, we have to have a path. We have to see a path to that billion dollar business through some way, shape, or form. We may it take a while to get there, but we have to believe it and see a path there. 
but it also means that we may have to move faster and do some acquisitions or invest in other categories in order to buy either revenue, customers, or platforms to scale and get to that opportunity faster. And we've heard some of this already, but we need to shift traditional metrics. So yes, we are a publicly traded company, and cash flow is what matters. That's what we value our stock on, et cetera. But this is a learning journey. And so how do we get the business comfortable with the outlook that we can see a billion dollars of cash flow in the future, but along the way, we may have to look at measures differently. We may have to look at proof points that we're validating what's in that business model or not. We may have to look at the unit economics much more closer than the bottom line. We may have to look at the learnings along the way and recognize the shifts in, in the pivots along the way as well. So we're still working on this. I don't have all the right answers, but we certainly are starting a dialogue to figure out what are the right ways to measure the success or failure of some of these new businesses. I'm so over time, but please welcome back Brian. <laughs> Take a seat. Okay. Um, explain the makeup of your team, first of all, and where it sits within Comcast. Great question. Um, so we sit within the cable division, which generates about 60% of our adjusted EBITDA every year. We report to the CEO. Uh, and our team is made up, again, of deal makers, Right, people who are out there every single day talking to the Amazons, Facebooks of the world, et cetera, and doing deals on behalf of the core business. Mm -hmm. And the other half of the team is focused on this new business incubation. Okay, so let's, let's start with the business incubation. Explain the timeline, because I think a lot of, if there's one theme from, from your presentation, mm -hmm. it's Comcast is a gigantic company, $85 billion, that provides a lot of opportunities, mm -hmm. but it also provides a lot of challenges. Yeah. So explain what the, the process and the timeline is for one of these new initiatives, and, sure. and that you, you move with rigor, but quick enough. Yeah, well I still said we need to move faster. <laughs> I know. Um, so maybe I'll give an example yeah. um, of Machine Q. So we had um, some early technical investigations into this kind of lower WAN uh, technology starting in 2016. And we had uh, people, and, and this is important, our team doesn't necessarily generate all the best ideas. Ideas come from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so we partnered with our Comcast Labs team and there was someone investigating this technology in 2016. Someone on our team said, I think we can turn this into a business opportunity and not just a technology that could be used internally. That probably took, I don't know, six months to understand the technology and to start building the initial business model for what we could do. It's at that point, probably in later 2016, when we developed a relationship with Semtech, and Semtech is one of our partners that helped us deploy this network to those 15 markets. Uh, and uh, we brokered that deal in 2016, and then, again, it probably took another good six to eight months to get a product that we felt good about bringing to market and get and start launching, which is what happened in the end of 2017. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you speed that up? <laughs> great question. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do. We can have more, I think, earlier conversations with business owners, and, I, and you know, every company is different. We are certainly a uh, consensus-driven organization. Uh, and lots of people have uh, voices. Um, I hope not everybody has a vote all the time, but certainly lots of voices. I think sometimes we, we t keep things to ourselves too much until we're completely ready, and then we say, aha, here's this great idea. And we haven't necessarily brought other people in the business along with us. And so I think we actually have to be a little bit more open with what we're thinking and where we're going and start socializing this idea that if we're gonna be in the connectivity business, there's this huge gap in terms of the type of connectivity we provide or don't provide to these types of, of businesses and these types of connectivity so that by the time we come with a great idea, that notion of the gaps we're trying to fill are already well accepted. Yeah. But do you have to like have a billion dollar success story for, for to get all of the internal buy-in? It's impossible to have it, right, at the beginning. Um, but like I said, I think what we need to do is show people a path to get there. Mm -hmm. We're never going to be perfectly right with our approach or our business case. But if people can understand the fundamental assumptions and then you keep talking to them along the way about whether we're proving or disproving those assumptions, I think it actually makes people feel a lot more at ease, that we're being good stewards of capital, that we have an audacious goal. Our CFO likes to say, we don't do hobbies, right? So 
Like this is nice, but we don't do hobbies. Like what are you trying to build towards? And I think if you can explain that to people and explain the levers in the business model that you're going to test and market more and sooner mm -hmm. and more often, that actually will help a lot. Mm -hmm. But capital, we have a lot of things that get in the way of getting things done. Capital and funding is usually not one of them. Again, it's getting access to people's roadmaps, getting prioritization, getting our sales and marketing channel to support it against all the other priorities that they have to generate the business that we have today or support the business that we have right. today. So how many of these initiatives can you have going on at the same time? Our target, we have a target, and it's not always kind of um, the, the in flight, but we have a target to go through about 10 new ideas. So our ideation, we like to have about 10 ideas we're kind of just learning, scratching the surface on, getting familiar with, and then we try to have about three to four in flight. In flight, in market, trying to prove a specific business model, and that's like the machine queue example, and then an exit, one exit every maybe one to two years into the core business. Mm -hmm. So success for us is it exits our group, is adopted by the core business where we can put the full weight and engine of the company behind it to get to scale at a much greater level. That is what happened with Xfinity Mobile a year ago before it was incubated. In. Yeah. So in journalism, we have an expression about drowning your kittens. I don't know if you have it there, but it's, it's an unfortunate one that unfortunate. sometimes you can become very attached to something, oh. an idea, and you, <laughs> have to, you have to you know, take it into the bathtub. Um, do you have to do that? <laughs> and what, what, uh, what process do you go to to figure out the kittens that have to <laughs> unfortunately kittens. go into the bathtub? Yeah, we, that's a difficult conversation. So part, um, unfortunately, it's part of my job, which is uh, as kind of the overall portfolio owner, like we have to believe that the overall portfolio is going to generate a return. And sometimes that means we need to put a little more focus in this mm -hmm. kitten, sure. uh, <laughs> a little less in, in this one. Um, it's, it's a hard conversation, but I think what you can do is try to have a conversation based on data and facts versus emotion. Right. And if, again, if we can't, if we don't have a good story of not just kind of where we're going, but the traction along the way, and that we're validating things along the way, and I don't have good data for that, I can't help socialize and get the support yeah. from other people in the business. So give an example of, of, of a kitten that didn't make it. Oh. Publicly? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Um, no, poor just three kitten. Us. Uh, <laughs> so we've had, I mean, I kind of referenced one, which was gaming. We had to kill it, unfortunately. Um, we, again, had this interesting concept that we have this powerful platform in the home, and there's this whole kind of category of latent gamers who didn't necessarily want to invest in an Xbox One or whatever the new gadget was. Um, and could we take kind of advantage of that market? Was that market big enough and interesting enough and could our platforms deliver low latency and interesting gaming experiences? The problem, and we had a belief that people would pay. Um, so we got started, we got some light integrations, but the in integration was never what it needed to be to get the, the true consumer engagement. Mm -hmm. And the consumer engagement that we did get, people weren't necessarily willing to pay for. So again, I had to look at it and say either we're going to invest and work with the company to make sure it's a fully fledged product that can live side by side with all the other entertainment experiences people can choose from today. Um, and we can prove that people are willing to pay something for it. If we can't prove those, then I need to take that capital that we're investing there and probably deploy it to some place where we have a little more confidence, a little more potential. Now, I say that, but I also say that we sometimes create accidental innovation. And it's sad for us that we had to drown the kit, and I really don't like okay, that, but something else. kill this little project. <laughs> um, but sometimes it gets reincarnated in a different way. <laughs> okay. You're going with it. I love uh, it. And this has happened with a couple of our projects, another one called Watchable, where we were trying to target digital native yeah. content producers, right? Um, and deliver this kind of, uh, you know, YouTube-esque experience to uh, right. older That didn't work out, I remember. We, we had to unfortunately kill it. Yeah, well. Well, hats have nine lives. Hats have nine. But what happened is that those 
relationships that we develop both in the gaming industry and in the digital native content area, and the platforms that we actually built, especially for Watchable, are now the foundation for a new product that we're about to launch inside our core business. So it changed the conversation about a whole category of content that we were ignoring. Yeah. Maybe the new business venture didn't work out the way we expected, but we found ways to influence what the core business roadmap is, and they are now reutilizing those assets in different ways. So you talked about um, a bias internally to create it here, and I think a lot of large companies have that. Um, but you see like within technology companies how acquisitions mm -hmm. have been absolutely critical to these companies continuing to be yeah. um, on the forefront. I mean, think about Instagram being yeah. bought by Facebook. Yeah. Do you think Comcast needs to get more acquisitive when it comes to emerging technology? I think the answer is yes. Um, I think we have been acquisitive, uh, but we've been acquisitive in areas that we know very well. Mm -hmm. So it's no surprise that um, we just closed a deal and we bought Sky, which is a satellite and media company in the UK. Um, that decision was fairly easy to make when you look at the different ways that, again, you can grow your core business and new markets or new products or new customers, et cetera. Um, but it was also an easier case to make because people understand that business yeah. fundamentally today. The challenge that we have in the new business category is I do believe that we need to be more acquisitive sooner, but we have to get people inside the business to gain, like, have some level of comfort with this new category. I can't go to our CFO tomorrow and say, let's buy a solar company. Right. And they're like, I, I'm not, I, I don't understand, <laughs> right? Um, so I definitely think we need to acquire sooner to get to scale sooner, but we have to find other ways of gaining confidence and drawing the, the link for the you know, more traditional people in our business to why these categories matter before right. we can just say, let's go buy X, Y, Z. We are trying to take advantage of the partnerships we already have. So we have an early stage. When I said you know, we have kind of you know, things in early stage ideation, mm -hmm. we're starting to like think about it and pilot some stuff. Um, our Comcast Ventures team invested in a company called Hippo in their Series B, I think. Um, and they're disrupting the home insurance market. And so before we decide to go buy a home insurance company, maybe, I don't know, um, but we can certainly work with a company we already have an investment in, structure some pilots to see is there a way to marry what they're trying to do to disrupt the home insurance market with the set of connectivity and IoT and smart devices that we offer on our platform to offer even more savings to our customers and then by doing that and seeing our, how our customers react and working with a known entity through our ventures portfolio, I think we can also get to some of these decisions about whether we should buy our way into these spaces faster right. or not. Okay, cool. Ebony, thank you so All much. Right. <laughs> Thanks you. Appreciate it. Okay. okay.